Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Moynard. I'm the chair of the uh, La Trobe Art History uh, Alumni Chapter from, from La Trobe University. And uh, I welcome you all uh, to this um, Ray Alexander lecture for 2022. And this is a very special occasion for us. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people uh, as the traditional owners on the land in which the National Gallery of Victoria is built. We acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. And we also acknowledge any Indigenous peoples in the audience this evening. So for 25 years, the Art History Alumni Group at La Trobe has organised a lecture on the fine arts. And so this is a very memorable occasion for us to have reached the grand old age of 25. We have had artists, academics, gallery directors and collectors give lectures on artistic endeavour in Victoria and in the rest of Australia. We have chosen lecturers who have been associated with La Trobe University and its academic art history programs and its visual arts practice. And tonight is no different. And a lecturer is someone who has studied at La Trobe University and has been a very generous donor to the university's art collection. But more of that later. I would like to thank all those who have supported this event especially the La Trobe Art History Alumni Committee. And we're all volunteers, we all do lots of other things, uh, but it's been a real pleasure to work with such an outstanding committee. I'd like to acknowledge the La Trobe uh, Alumni Office and the enormous work that they've put into uh, making this happen tonight. The La Trobe uh, Art Institute and the School of Humanities and Social Scientists, Sciences at La Trobe University. And I'd also like to thank the National Gallery of Victoria for hosting uh, this lecture this evening in this wonderful auditorium. And we're very fortunate at La Trobe to have such a strong relationship with the National Gallery. In fact, we were just talking in the foyer uh, of the 25 years uh, how many of these lectures have ha happened here at the National Gallery of Victoria. I certainly know in the last 10 years that I've been involved with the Art History Alumni. They've been here, except for last year and the year before, where due to COVID, we had to uh, do uh, our lectures by Zoom. But um, uh, it's been a very long and fruitful relationship with the National Gallery. Now, this lecture is being recorded, and uh, that recording will be available on YouTube in the next week or so. Uh, we're also having a roving photographer, and there she is on the side, um, who is uh, taking uh, photos of the event. And um, please do let her know if uh, you do not wish to be photographed. Finally, I'd ask if you could uh, turn your mobile phones to silent um, or turn them off uh, before we start the formal proceedings. But now it's my great pleasure to invite the Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Industry Engagement at La Trobe University, Professor Susan Dodds, to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. As I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the edge of Boorurung, on the Yarra River, on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, most of you here know Michael Moynard as the chair of the La Trobe University Art History Alumni chap Chapter, and it's wonderful that the chapter is such a significant part of the La Trobe alumni community and it continues its engagement with La Trobe University through their volunteer-run group, um, and it's a fantastic inspiration to the other chapters among our alumni. It's also wonderful to be here for this 25th year of the Ray Alexander Lecture. 
a remarkable achievement, and I congratulate the Art History Alumni Group for their efforts in maintaining and supporting such an important lecture series. And I want to thank also the National Gallery of Victoria for supporting the lecture through making this fantastic space available to us. Um, it's lovely to be in such a great place to see um, fantastic talks. Um, the, our relationship with the National Gallery of Victoria is one of three really key Melbourne-based um, arts and culture partnerships, along with our relationship with um, the State Library and with the Australian Ballet. Um, in fact, I was just Friday here uh, at an event with them. Uh, in Bendigo, we also have a very strong relationship with the Bendigo Art Gallery, and I think that um, those partnerships make a stronger university. But my job tonight is to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Raby, and it's always a pleasure to celebrate the achievements of other La Trobe alumni. Uh, and uh, Dr. Jeff Raby, AO, has certainly achieved a lot since completing his studies at the university. He holds a Bachelor of Economics with honors, 1977. Master of Economics, 1981, PhD in Economics, 1991, and was recently awarded an honorary Doctorate of Letters, Honoris Causa, on the 29th of September from La Trobe University. Jeff Raby was Australia's ambassador to China from 2007 to 11, during which time he visited all of its provinces in an official capacity. He served in Beijing as first Secretary Economic and then Councillor Economic, 1986 to 1991. He's been ambassador to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, ambassador to the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation, and deputy secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I think I got that right, 2003 to seven. He's now a non-executive independent director of the ASX listed companies, Yanko and Netlinks, and uh, sits on the board of the Gavin Foundation. His most recent book is China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the World Order. Melbourne University Press, November 2020. And he also contributes op-eds and travel writing to the Australian Financial Review and has a major piece coming out soon. In 2019, he was awarded the Order of Australia for advancing relations between Australia and China and for his contribution to multilateral trade diplomacy, a seriously significant career. We're here, however, to talk about Jeff's amazing gift to Latrobe. He's made an absolutely outstanding donation of his collection of art to La Trobe University. The collection of over 174 artworks collected over a period of 30 years was donated in 2019 under the Cultural Gifts Program, a federal government initiative. It's the single largest gift ever to La Trobe University. Currently valued, a cultural gift ever to La Trobe University, cultural currently valued at over 3.15 million. The collection includes culturally and artistically important works, a selection of which can now be enjoyed in the, uh, by the community at the Bendigo Art Gallery until February 2023. This collection is a very significant resource for the university, contributing to our research and teaching and our outreach and complementing our strategic focus on Asia and China. A few weeks ago, uh, as part or after the uh, Bendigo um, La Trobe Open Day, uh, I was visiting the Bendigo campus um, and with my partner made a trip over to the art gallery of, uh, for the exhibition in our time, Four Decades of Art from China and Beyond, the Jeff Raby Collection. And I encourage you all to make the similar trip. It's a wonderful exhibition that displays some of the excellent contemporary Chinese art and artists contained in this wonderful gift known as the Jeff Raby Collection. The works are astoundingly beautiful and technically exquisite. Many are confronting, some are shocking, uh, and they play on the cultural language of traditional Chinese art, Marxist references, Maoist slogans, and the omnipresence of Mao himself. Uh, it's certainly well worth your time and a stunning example of how art brings to the forefront of the mind facets of contemporary history that are too often overlooked. As it happens, I was traveling with my partner, who's a labor historian, a Marxist by background, steeped in Marxist literature, who visited Moscow in the 70s and has rich research collaborations with labor historians. Um, he's visited across Southeast Asia and in Vietnam in particular. We both became deeply absorbed by the, work, uh, by the works, by their beauty, the juxtaposition of theory and reality, their humor and their emotional pull. Fantastic little snippet of the total co uh, collection. 
So the exhibition is uh, showing until February 23. It features 75 works from the collection, collected over 30 years, a range of works from leading contemporary uh, Chinese artists since the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976. Uh, across a range of media, including painting, photography, drawing, ceramics, sculpture, and textiles. So con congratulations to Bala Starr and her team in the Latrobia Art Institute, who are co-presenting in our time in partnership with the Bendigo Art Gallery. Um, and uh, it's really been a fantastic collaboration and a fantastic opportunity to unpack and make visible uh, some of that gift. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Jeff Raby to, to commence the 25th annual Ray Alexander Lecture, The Accidental Collection, the Jeff Raby Collection of Chinese Contemporary Art. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, uh, everyone, and thanks for coming out on such a uh, miserable day. Last Thursday, I was in Sydney um, opening a, uh, a show, an art show that I curated um, to celebrate uh, 50 years of uh, Australia-China bilateral relations. And uh, uh, I started my remarks by saying to the, the people, because it was such a wet night in Sydney, it had been wet for three weeks, that uh, great you all came out, but I think we all better go to Melbourne for some good weather. <laughs> so that was like most of my usual calls, not very good. Um, Susan, thanks for those introductory remarks. Michael, for inviting me, and I'd like to make a special thank you to Anna Joski, who's put together all the slides for this evening. Um, believe it or not, I've not given a, a, a talk on the art collection like this. I made some remarks in Bendigo when we opened the show, but this is my first, if you like, art lecture. Um, so it's a, a new thing for me, and I don't like using uh, slides and things like that, but um, I realised that I needed to have pictures, I needed to have visuals, so at very short notice, uh, Anna did a brilliant job uh, pulling together uh, the photos you're going to see. Um, so my talk, as Susan said, is called The Accidental Collector, because that's you know, very much what I am. Uh, it's a personal story about someone who knew a little, but not much, about the history of art, uh, lacking entirely any artistic talent, but who knew just enough to realise that when I arrived in Beijing in March 1986 uh, on my first diplomatic assignment, I had landed in the middle of something that was extraordinarily exciting uh, in the history of contemporary art and would ultimately have a global impact, although I didn't uh, think that far ahead at the time. And the story is of someone who spent a lot of time with the artists, cavorting, eating, drinking. There's a lot of that through this uh, lecture tonight. Um, uh, but at the same time, was in the serious business of daily studying, analysing, reporting and advising on the implications of the far-reaching changes that were occurring in China in those years as it opened up and began the gradual process of reform. In doing so this evening, I hope to take you on a journey through the course of China's contemporary art during its first 40 years. Now, this is not an academic exercise this evening. It is uh, really uh, about uh, individual friendships, uh, drunken long lunches and dinners in remote art villages and basic artist studios, uh, the occasional bon vivant art dealer, and a great deal of serendipity. Throughout much of this period, I regarded myself as accumulating pieces of art. I never thought or felt of myself until much later as a collector. Uh, sometimes I'd wake up the next morning after a big night uh, on the Terps with the artists and gaze at something that I brought home <laughs> and think, what was I thinking? Uh, and, 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 and yet, uh, to my rhetorical question, I'd usually answer not much. Uh, but towards the end uh, of the period, um, and when I uh, uh, had more money and I started buying pieces, um, I started to think more about rounding out my collection. And so there was a transition from the hap haphazard and random uh, to a, um, someone who was more conscious about starting to build a collection. We'll talk about that a bit later. The one thing I've experienced in my collection and whatever state I was in when I 
purchase works. Um, uh, I've, never, uh, I've never regretted what I've bought. Interestingly, the only pieces that I have regretted, as there are only a few, thank goodness, were those that for some reason, uh, someone whispering in my ear perhaps, uh, but for whatever reason, I um, thought that the pieces might become more valuable and that I looked at it through the eyes of an investor rather than just an art lover. Um, I didn't do it often, but it is the case that the pieces that I bought for that reason are the ones that do least for me and that I, I, I do actually think was uh, uh, not necessary to buy. Now, chronologically, the collection begins in the pre-reform period, um, obviously long before I was in, in, in China. Uh, the reforms which began in 1979, following the arrest of the Gang of Four and the installation of Deng Xiaoping in power, ushered in a new contemporary art movement in China. This movement brought together two distinctive strands, propaganda art, largely inherited from the Soviet Union, and traditional Chinese imagery. Another distinctive feature uh, was that the contemporary artists were mainly superbly well-trained in official academies, not all, but most. And I think that marks Chinese contemporary art out from many other uh, places where you can see uh, contemporary art. And in the academies, technique and tradition prevailed above all else, especially above creative thinking. So once the place loosened up a bit and artists could step out of the academies and start to think creatively, uh, then you had a very um, uh, a, a creative bonfire that, that was just waiting to be lit, and it, and, it, and it was. So the first part of what, we'll talk, what I'll talk about this evening will be propaganda and revolution. And these are the historical antecedents to what started to emerge throughout the course of the 1980s. Uh, my earliest uh, collected piece is this one. Um, it's a propaganda poster from the period 75 to 77. Uh, and I didn't buy it. I acquired it through a friend of mine who uh, I shared a house with when we were students. And he went uh, with this funny organization called the Australia-China Friendship Association to do a, uh, a trip to China in 1977. And it was just amazing to think someone actually went to China. In those days, I'd never been. It was a complete mystery. I wondered if I'd ever go in my life to China. And uh, George, his name was, I just remembered, uh, brought this poster back. And the poster is highly significant because next to Mao in the top right-hand corner is Hua Guofeng. And this is establishing the transition uh, from uh, Mao to Hua. Uh, and George would have spent, paid two cents for it in Beijing on his tour. He gave it to me as a gift on his return, and strangely, after all those years and being on the wall of so many student houses, uh, I still have it, and it's still in reasonably good, um, reasonably good condition. Um, the next one uh, is an extremely important piece, and, and very, very rare. Um, this is the earliest piece in the entire collection. This is a carpet from Xinjiang, and the carpet is from 1942, it's in the socialist realist style, uh, which is so similar, uh, as you'll see, well, as you saw in the poster that's just gone before, but there's 35 years between the two. Uh, and the style can be seen in different forms throughout the collection, uh, in serious applications during the ideological period, and then irreverently and even cynically later on. It is a continuous thread that's running through the collection even to one of the most recent pieces by Guo Zhen, which we'll see shortly. I purchased the carpet only in 2017, following a trip around Central Asia. Having crossed over the Tian Shan Mountains to, from, uh, uh, Tian Shan Mountains from uh, 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 Tajikistan to Xinjiang and then on to Kashgar, I took some of my traveling companions, two guys, uh, to my friend uh, Abdul, the carpet salesman in central Kashgar, just near the, the big um, Grand Mosque. And whilst Abdul was showing them new carpets, I was just wandering around the carpet store and found in the back of Abdul's um, uh, office this thing hanging up. And I said to uh, Abdul, what's that? And he said, oh, it's Guomingdang. 
KMT. And I said, no, it's not. It's, it's absolutely not. It's Soviet. He said, no, it's KMT. It's 1942, and 1942 is woven into the, the carpet. And I said, yeah, yeah, but, but it's not. It's, it's Soviet. So a little research later, and I discovered that the warlord of Xinjiang in those days had actually gone across to the Soviets. And, of course, the Soviets were trying to take uh, Xinjiang into the Soviet empire. And it is a, a, a Soviet uh, propaganda rug made in Hotan, uh, which is the centre of carpet weaving in Xinjiang even to today. Um, and it's very much in that socialist Soviet, Soviet realist style. Uh, the next one's here for a bit of fun. I mentioned the uh, exhibition I opened last week in Sydney. Uh, in that photo is me and Stephen Fitzgerald, Australia's first ambassador to China. And it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing print. Uh, it appears in the collection in a smaller version than that. The artist is Shen Jia Wei. Shen Jia Wei uh, was a military artist in the early 70s. This was painted in 1973, oil on canvas. It sold for a million dollars back in 2007, and the original hangs in the Lung Museum in Shanghai. Shen Jia Wei is a Chinese national treasure, but lives in Bandina in New South Wales, and has lived there since the 1980s, and almost no one knows this. Uh, but in the exhibition, in, in the show I did last week, uh, uh, this, we, we had the prints and it was actually very, very popular. Um, but uh, when he painted that in 1973, Zhang uh, Qing, Madame Mao, declared that it was the greatest painting in post-revolutionary -revolution, China and ordered that these small uh, prints be made and distributed for propaganda purposes. And that's what appears in my collection, which was well, the Trobes collection now, with um, an annotation uh, from Shen Jia Wei explaining uh, the history of this painting. It's an extraordinary history. I won't keep going on about it now, but it, 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 it goes to New York. It goes to the Guggenheim. Uh, there's great... Um, uh, it's, was, the painting was nearly lost. Uh, it really could be a sort of uh, mini documentary drama just about the history of this one painting. Uh, so we're very lucky to have Shen Jia Wei in Australia, but also uh, I'm lucky to have uh, one of the prints that Zhang Qing ordered to be made uh, in the collection. Moving on, the next one is uh, uh, another uh, propaganda piece from that period. The Chinese characters say, Da uh, Dao da Surinbang, down with the Gang of Four. And this was when the Gang of Four were being tried in Beijing, and this was part of the propaganda uh, uh, to uh, uh, shift people's attitude towards Jiang Qing and the Gang of Four. And of course, these were elite, powerful political figures in China until their downfall, so the party had a lot of explaining to do, and this was part of the effort. But what's unique about this is it's actually uh, painted on ceramic. And I was in a, poking around a little antique shop uh, uh, in Jiangxi province, Jingdezhan, actually, which is the center of, um, historical center of China's porcelain industry. Saw this up on a, on a shelf and uh, looked at it and thought, wow, that, that's fascinating. I had no idea it was made from porcelain. I said, can I have a look at that? And the guy got a ladder and he struggled and nearly went over backwards bringing it down off the top shelf. It really weighs a lot. Um, and, and it's a porcelain propaganda um, exercise. So very delighted to have uh, come across that and it's obviously you know, pure, pure serendipity. So this is the, if you like, the, 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 the cultural revolution, the propaganda, uh, revolutionary, socialist realism antecedents to much of the um, Chinese contemporary art movement that breaks forth during the, the 1980s. The period in the 1980s when I first arrived and started collecting uh, Chinese contemporary art was, was really a romantic, naive period uh, when artists and the wider society were soaking up, the, uh, soaking up and responding to the new, albeit limited, freedoms coming in the early years of reform and the opening to the outside world. Um, it was a time when we all rode bicycles and wore heavy military overcoats um, and the bicycles were really hard to get, and then they'd break down after half an hour. But luckily in those days in Beijing, every 100 metres there was someone to fix your bicycle on the side of the road for a few fen. Um, but it, it was a, a truly romantic uh, um, uh, world. In fact, 
my, my old boss at the time, Colin Hesseltine's here, uh, and, and we all experienced that extraordinary period in, in, in Beijing, which probably will never leave you. And so this is a very special connection we all have with the art from that time. Um, and it was a time of artistic experimentation, which won't surprise anyone, uh, with figurative painting using oil on canvas and copying the West was exciting, new and radical. So the next three paintings were the first three paintings I ever bought. Uh, the artist in the first two, uh, Lin Chun Yen. That's a self-portrait of by Lin Chun Yen. And Damien, who's here, who put together, curated my catalogue, uh, actually, I don't, still don't know the story, found the original black and white photograph of Lin Chun Yen and a friend that he um, um, painted for this uh, self-portrait. Uh, this is another one of, of Chun Yen's paintings. And the thing about these, these paintings to note is uh, how damaged the canvases are. And the materials were really poor. Uh, the, this one, it took years, like a decade or more, for the paint to dry. And as it was moved around, the, the, the paint was damaged. It's, it's impossible, really, to, to convey how poor everybody was in those days. And amongst everyone, the artists were amongst the poorest. Uh, these works cost nothing, but they also were made of the cheapest materials you could imagine. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it, we all just accepted that. I mean, we as diplomats lived a pr very, very privileged life. Um, but uh, uh, there was this romanticism of going to, I used to go to Chun Yen's studio a lot and just sit there and drink uh, warm beer if it's summer or cold beer if it's winter, uh, smoke cigarettes and uh, I just talk and, 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 and look at art and uh, his studio was a single room which had a bed, uh, a, a charcoal fireplace, a, a brassier, um, did a bit of cooking on that and that's where he had his canvases and paint and everything stacked up in different corners. This next one I've put up, uh, ASEAN, uh, is Stop. Now, it actually has uh, a, a, another name. I don't know how we ended up with Stop, because Stop is the, the sign, Ting, in the, in the painting. But there's another name for it, which is uh, Pay Attention to Security. Or I may be wrong, it may be the whole series was Pay Attention to Security. That's right. And in this particular painting, of a series of eight, uh, this one is called, um, uh, this one's called Stop. Uh, now, as in, in this has, is, 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 is conveying an overtly political theme, which is quite challenging. In some ways, I think of it as being a Edward Hopper, Jeffrey Smart-like scene, devoid of people, its emptiness creating a sense of anxiety. Uh, the angle from the top looking down is also disturbing because it speaks of surveillance, even, even back then. Um, and the sign, as I mentioned, is the stop sign in Chinese. Um, and as I said, the series, not this one, I, I made a mistake before, is pay attention to security, Jui Antoine. And even today, if you're in Beijing, sitting in a car and a bus pulls up, public bus pulls up next to you, when the doors open, they just repeat Jui Antoine, Jui Antoine, Jui Antoine. Um, but it is actually, um, uh, as I said, it's a double entendre. It's, it's security is used in a number of different ways here. So the next two uh, are from Guan Wei. And many of you will be very familiar with Guan Wei's work. I put them in really uh, just to show you some of his earlier work, but they also speak to themes of alienation and state control. Um, and uh, there's a very nice story about this because I first saw them at uh, Nick Joseph's, he was a cultural counselor then, apartment in um, one of the diplomatic compounds in Beijing. And we did this all the time because none of the artists could show their art in commercial, well, there was no commercial galleries, none whatsoever, but uh, in public spaces, um, the, uh, the exhibitions were held in uh, diplomats' apartments. And we'd clean the furniture or clear the furniture away for the weekend, hang the works, and Chinese people had to be escorted through the gates past the security one by one. And there was a great uh, party that afternoon at Nick's place that went well into the evening. It was the first time I met Guan Wei and it's the first time I, I met, uh, I, I saw Guan Wei's uh, works. These are all on canvas, 
very rough. There are a couple of them in the Bendigo show. I forget whether it's these exact ones or not. Uh, but there was a bit of a debate between me for all of these early works and, and Barla, the curator of the Bendigo show, because the Institute was very worried about damage that could be done to the works because they are in quite a fragile condition um, because, as I said, the materials and, uh, were so poor. But having said that, they're damaged in any case, so it all just adds to the, uh, the effect. So I'm sure they're all fine in Bendigo. So this... For this part of the lecture, I, I, I bring it to an end and um, move on to then the denouement. This is the end of the naive, optimistic, hopeful uh, period of the 1980s that came off the back of reforms from the, early, from the late 70s. And the tragedy of Tiananmen Square happens in 89. And that's an end. And it, it ends a period, it ends a time. And we go into another period. Um, I have these two, this one by Chang Chi and then the very, very famous one by Xia Lu with the gun. Um, these are both much later retrospectives on Tiananmen Square. Uh, there wasn't, as far as I know, any art produced during that incredibly turbulent uh, and disturbing time. Um, and Colin and I were both in uh, Beijing at that time. Uh, this one's quite interesting, Chang Chi. He's famous for having chopped off his little finger as a protest over Tiananmen Square, what happened, and then exiled himself to London. But he did come back in the 2000s and had an exhibition at Brian Wallace's Redgate Gallery, uh, which was a second branch Brian had in those days at uh, 798 Art District. And it's absolutely Tiananmen Square. It's absolutely student demonstrators. The headbands are exactly what was worn. Uh, but on the headbands, what is said in Chinese is uh, end imperialism. Nothing about the slogans from Tiananmen Square. And Chang Chi had hoped that might have been a ruse that would get, allow him to get away with showing these in public. Um, probably not subtle enough because this and another, another one I've got in the collection from Chang Chi uh, had to be removed from the walls and hidden during the, the course of the exhibition. The next one has is, is got a story to it that I could spend half the evening telling, and I, 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 I won't, but it is a very, very significant uh, piece. Um, this is by Xiao Lu, uh, who uh, is famous for having taken a gun with live ammunition in to the opening of China's first ever avant-garde exhibition in February 1989, and she had an installation uh, of two characters made of cardboard talking to each other in telephone booths and she took the gun out of her breast and uh, shot her own installation with live bullets which caused an incredible uh, uproar and of course even the fact that the show had been staged was itself hugely controversial. The, the debate and the discussion about this because it was being held, well it was being held in the first place but it was also being held at the Meishuguan, the National Art Museum and this would be the first ever official recognition of avant-garde or Chinese contemporary art. Uh, after she shot the uh, installation, the exhibition was closed immediately. Huge debate for two weeks, open for three or four days and forever closed. Uh, the, title of the, the title of the show was called A No U-Turn. So uh, this is a piece, as you can see, from 2004. She has done variations of... Uh, of that uh, installation and performance art, uh, but as I said, this is th this is very very significant. Um, it's very significant piece. Uh, so after after Tiananmen Square and after that time, there was a hiatus in just about everything in China for a few years, and the art contemporary art movement only started to re-energize really into the middle and latter part of the 1990s, and that's uh, the period where you get um, what's called uh, Cynical realism. And cynical realism became a movement, and it's probably the most defining part of Chinese contemporary art. Most people, if you think about Chinese contemporary art, will think about cynical realism. Uh, and cynical realism kicks in once Deng Xiaoping goes in 92 down uh, south to uh, Shenzhen and Guang, uh, Guangzhou, does his southern tour. Um, the pedal, gets, the foot gets put on the pedal of reform and opening, and the place starts to rev up again and take off. Um, and of course, the whole thing with the Chinese contemporary art movement is that it both mirrors and leads change or anticipates change in society. 
uh, as a result of these very profound economic and political changes that are uh, sweeping through the place. And, uh, and, and by the mid-late 90s, artists are starting to, having lost the naivety of the earlier period and, and experiencing the disappointment and, 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 and the fear of Tiananmen Square, um, look at China in a different way and they start to see the material excess. No longer is China the poor place that we all knew in the 1980s and the romantic place, but it's, it's suddenly there's, there's, there's money and consumption and excess and extravagance uh, and inequality. And, and, and with that, um, the cynical realist movement started to document those changes uh, in, uh, in China through their work. Uh, the first one, um, oops, doesn't matter. Um, not the first on my list, but that's okay. The, uh, this is uh, from the very start of that period, 1997. It's an enormous um, uh, oil on canvas painting of a happy pig uh, waving to the glorious socialist future. Um, and of course, it's Chairman Mao. Uh, the same artist, Lita Pung, uh, did this piece. Oops, I've got it right away, sorry. Um, did this piece, pig in a, uh, pink pig in a spacesuit. Uh, that's from 2007. And that's when I first got to know Lita Pung. He had this hanging in a restaurant in the Sung Duong Art Village, you know, quite a way outside of Beijing. And I walked in and I just was riveted when I saw it. I looked at it and I knew immediately what he was doing. I knew that he was sending up the Chinese space, space program. And 2007, of course, was the first year that China put a person in space and the propaganda organs were in overdrive. So it's funny, because I used to have that um, in, uh, in my residence at the embassy, and I'd see these Chinese officials walk in and stop and look at this pink pig in a spacesuit, and you could hear what they were thinking. What's the ambassador got a pig in a spacesuit for? Because, you know, what we know, but they don't know, the great thing about communist systems is they have no irony and, and, and no sense of humour. And it's a complete send-up. So, when I saw that, I knew if I went to his studio what I'd find. So I asked around through some contacts in Sung Duong. I eventually went out to the studio and actually the day I went there, I was taking uh, Andrew Forrest, who's well known to everybody here, I'm sure, uh, out to look at the Arts Village as a way of entertaining him one Sunday afternoon. And we go out to Lita Pung's studio, um, pretty basic, full of work, and I found what I expected to see, happy little pigs, building the Goldman to Lhasa Railway, building the Three Gorges Dam, building shopping centres, car parks. It was fantastic. It was exactly what I expected. Andrew loved it. And this huge work had just been finished of the, uh, of the Goldman to Lhasa Railway. And Andrew said, oh, I'm going to buy that. I'm building railways in Australia. I want that. Uh, I like railways. So Andrew bought it. Uh, lack of irony and humour is not confined to the Chinese communists. So six months later or something, I turn up in Perth at Andrew's office, FMG's headquarters, and here's this buddy uh, painting in the foyer. And, and the artist's got his picture next to it and this, you know, the name of it. And I went in and I said, Andrew, look, um, I've got to tell you this. Uh, I'd advise you maybe not have it in such a public place. What do you mean? What's wrong? I know what I'm doing. Shut up. You know, okay. So anyway, I went back a few months later and had gone. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's a bit about Lita Pung. Uh, I'm sorry. This, yeah. So the next one is Yang Jing Sung. And he was uh, first introduced to me, uh, not in China, but in Sydney. Uh, Ray Hughes, I'm not sure how many people here know Ray. Ray was, had a major gallery in um, Devonshire Street, Surrey Hills in Sydney. Um, and Ray really was the pioneer of bringing Chinese contemporary art to Australia. And this was one of his earlier artists, Yang Jing Sung. And this was the last in a long series, which had started in the late 90s, um, of um, very big canvases. This one in my collection is quite small because he's actually quite expensive. Um, but the, the canvases portray or, 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 or comment on um, the, the breakneck growth of China in those years. And he uses the theme of rotting fish and rotting watermelon uh, on construction sites to, to make his points about uh, you know, the greed and the recklessness and the breakneck 
growth that was going on in, 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 in those days. And uh, uh, I, I've got to know Yang Jing Sung quite well. Um, and I think you know, these are very early but really quite powerful uh, statements about corruption, greed, venality, uh, and pollution um, in China's you know, dash for growth. Um, now, this is uh, Guo Zhen. Uh, it's a later one, but it's still very much in that socialist, you know, realist uh, uh, mold. Uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in, in, in the cynical realism mold. And I've got there partly because, and I've got a few more of um, uh, Guo Zhen. Uh, he was in the military, uh, and uh, he was in the Chinese invasion of Vietnam in 1979. Um, he eventually did a major... Uh, installation on Tiananmen Square uh, as his protest at the 25th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square events. And it was a diorama of Tiananmen Square, which he then, and I used to say to him, because I see him a lot, you know, we, we were great uh, white spirit baijiu drinking mates, and uh, I'd say to him, look, you're going to get yourself in terrible trouble with this. You know? So I suggested a typical diplomatic response and said, well, don't just have one on Tiananmen Square have one on Times Square um, and have one on Trafalgar Square. And so when they come for you, you can say, no, you're just doing the great squares around the world. It just, just... But the problem is he had helicopters shooting into Mao's mausoleum and the statue for the martyrs of the revolution on its side. And so it was going to end in tears, but that wasn't enough for Guo Zhen because he went off and bought 60, 30, 30 kilos of minced pork and his studio had a tin roof, and this is summer, uh, and covered the diorama of Tiananmen Square with minced pork and then let it rot. And he left it there for days, and it stank. It was just unbearable. And then he brought in a reporter from the Financial Times to photograph it and did an interview. So I was coming back to Beijing on a Saturday um, at that time and picked up the FT the airport and always flick to the uh, weekend pages, the arts pages and so on, and the sort of banner headline is about Guo Jen. And I read this thing and I thought, he's finished. He's completely finished. He's an Australian citizen, by the way, but, but uh, from Guizhou. Completely finished. And then I got to the last paragraph and I knew he was finished because there he said, I'd been a soldier in the PLA in uh, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War. I never saw the PLA spill any blood or kill anyone. Uh, it was only in Tiananmen Square I saw that. <laughs> that evening, I get a telephone call from a, from a mutual friend saying, do something about it, he's disappeared, he's gone, and he spent a few weeks in prison. But unlike today, where we'll probably never hear of him again, they kept him for three weeks and then booted him out with nothing, and they smashed the diorama and all of that. Uh, but he had his Australian passport, and he came to Australia, and he's rebuilt himself. And he was actually at Bendigo speaking at the... Uh, the Saturday morning forum in Bendigo. Um, so that's part of the, the whole story. This is Chi Ji Lung, uh, also another Ray Hughes artist in Sydney. And Chi Ji Lung, again, this is a series that started in the later, later part of the 1990s and went on. Uh, he uh, did these enormous canvases of these innocent, uh, uh, beautiful uh, young Chinese women all in Cultural Revolution military-style uh, dress. Um, and I took, um, I took uh, Madame Fu Ying when she was ambassador to see a big exhibition Ray Hughes had on this stuff in like 2006. And she was very grateful at first because um, she said, you know, I'd love to come and see it. I've heard about this stuff, but I've never, I have never known where to find it. So um, uh, I'll come and see the show. So when I got there before her to wait for her to arrive, I started looking around for myself and I thought, hmm, this is not actually a good idea. Now, you know, apart from the, the, the naked transvestites bouncing on a bed and various other things, I thought it's going to be fairly difficult to um, explain. So she turns up. But I, I did think, you know, it's a great test to see how genuinely cosmopolitan she was. That was the image she wanted to project. And this would test it. So we went around and she just you know, dutifully ignored the transvestite work and one thing or another. And then there was a, one that's in the collection, that's in Bendigo, um, of a little boy in Cultural Revolution outfit um, done by the Law Brothers. And she looked at that and said, I don't like it. 
And I said, well, what don't you like about it? And I thought, ha, oh, I've got to. Because she hadn't said anything about anything. And she turned around and looked at this huge Chi Lung uh, canvas and said, I love that. And I said, why? And she said, well, this is really what the culture revolution is about. The other one uh, was what foreigners think it was and how we felt about it, uh, how foreigners feel about it. She said, this is how we feel about it. It was a time of innocence. Uh, and then she went on for a long story about what she was doing. She was in Mongolia, uh, in a Mongolia. But I just thought it was very interesting. Two thematically almost identical works, uh, but one had a completely different effect on her than the other. But these, uh, unfortunately, were once hugely expensive. I don't think they are so much these days. But they were um, um, profitable enough that uh, uh, Chi Lung, the artist, was able to send his several children through Cranbrook School in, in Sydney. So he did well out of all of that. Now, this is the last sort of part of the, the, the lecture, and this is where I start to make the transition from being, uh, from, from being, a, um, uh, being an accumulator, rather, an accum accumulator with a completely chaotic and disorganised collection for all the reasons I've tried to explain, to when I started to be more purpo purposeful in uh, my collecting and, and more deliberate and started to think about what it was that I had. So that was around the time I went back to Beijing as ambassador and I had more money and whatever. Um, and these next three works, though, I, I bought them, again, from Ray Hughes in Sydney, although I do know the artist very well now, um, Lee Jin, and Lee Jin's been to Australia many times, uh, but was introduced by Ray. But these are quite interesting because now you start to see uh, the contemporary art going back to more traditional references, uh, pen and ink. Um, these are very much favoured by Korean Japanese collectors because of the Taoist references but still with that wonderful, irreverent humour um, that um, uh, is a characteristic, for me at least, and certainly is part of my collection, of the, uh, of, the, um, of the Chinese contemporary art movement. So we can go through these fairly quickly. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Li Jin on the toilet, self-portrait on the toilet, um, and being a suitor. Uh, this one was one of the few or I should say maybe too many, that I bought at Ray's place after a long lunch at his favourite French restaurant and went back to the studio. Now, when I first bought the, uh, the first and the third of these, they were only about $3,000 each. Uh, Legion now is at least, um, at least uh, 10 times that. And between the first two and the chap sitting on the toilet, the price had trebled, or maybe I just had a very long lunch and Ray took advantage of me. So this is a bit more serious collecting now, where I'm, I'm, collecting, I'm collecting to round out the collection um, and having more of an eye to, to big names, uh, uh, but significant pieces. Uh, this is Chen Men, uh, and it's um, uh, Madame Wong, uh, 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 Miss Wong. Miss Wong, uh, Miss Wong studies hard, and uh, uh, Chen Men, this was bought about six years ago, was then, I'm sure she still is today, the number one fashion photographer in China. And uh, Miss Wan is a major name in uh, modern contemporary jewellery design. Miss Wan also is the granddaughter of Vice Premier Wan Li. And Wan Li was regarded as one of the, the liberals in the 1980s period. In some ways, people thought maybe had he not been in Canada and back in China, uh, maybe Tiananmen Square might have evolved differently. Um, this has it all. It's, it's got a, a 1980s bicycle, which uh, was a precious item back in the 1980s. You, know, you had to have ration coupons, a special privilege to, get, to be able to buy one. Um, uh, you know, this one's got uh, a pile of books on the back tied up with a Dior ribbon. Um, and she's going past the gates of power of uh, Google, the forbidden city. So, and it's a very, very big piece uh, of photography. Uh, so it's a very, again, really uh, important piece for the time, um, but also marks my collection out as one that's moving to, as I said, a much more deliberate um, point of collecting uh, valuable works uh, from high-profile artists. These next two... Tan Chin, 
uh, again, from an artist who made his name in the early years of the Chinese contemporary art movement for photography. Uh, some of you, many of you may be familiar with the pile of naked bodies on top of each other photographed on top of uh, Taishan Mountain. Um, and that work has been in the Guggenheim and elsewhere, and he's had other works exhibited in the Guggenheim. Uh, it's very important, unlike uh, Chen Men, who I've never met. And so that work by that artist is one of the few in the collection where I've had no personal contact with. Uh, Tan Qing's been a, a, a friend for, for a very long time. Um, just moving on to, to this, which for me is one of my favourite pieces uh, in the collection, Ling Chen. Uh, but it also brings together all the themes that you may have noticed so far in the collection. Um, uh, the, the, what the collection is all about uh, sex, politics and power. Uh, it was never, I never set out to do that. That's just how it happened. And it reflected my taste and maybe the crazy people that I used to, to hang around with. But this is an extraordinary piece. It's an oil on, on canvas. Well, I hope you agree. Um, and it's in Bendigo, well worth seeing. Um, Ling Jen is a big, big name. And this is the single most expensive piece I've ever bought. Um, but I got it for a good price because he's a, he is a good friend, but he's a seriously big name. And um, I just had to have him in the collection. It just The collection would not have been complete without him. Uh, but I, I, I love it because it has this gorgeous naked body, the references to the Cultural Revolution with the red armbands and the naughty little cap uh, on an angle, uh, and of course it's Ling Jen's take on Botticelli's Venus. So that's another interesting point of reference. Um, the next one, uh, the romance, we're, we're back with Guo Jen. And I commissioned this piece, and it's the last piece in the collection that I added to the collection before giving it away. Uh, but again, I just like the way that the theme continued throughout, uh, has continued throughout the collection. I didn't give him any directions on what to paint. I just said, I just want one of your um, uh, uh, big um, uh, military type of pieces. And he came up uh, with this, which is, uh, I think, quite wild, uh, very much core gen. And if you have the time, this is not in, the, in Bendigo, which is a shame. Um, but if you have, have time at some stage to, to see it or get a chance to see it, it's well worth studying all the action that's going on in the water level and so on. It's very active. Now, here we have a controversial piece, I guess. Um, I'm a collector of her work. Rose Wong uh, was like 25 when she, she did this. It's the first piece I bought from her at a public um, uh, exhibition at a friend's gallery in Beijing. She's from Hong Kong, but has spent most of her professional career in Beijing. Uh, I think I said she was in the mid-20s when she did this. But I really was, when I saw it, I thought, wow. Uh, and I, I was attracted to the sort of youthful self, um, self-confidence and the um, recklessness in it. Um, and, you know, it, it is her attempt to comment on contemporary themes of gender, feminism and power and although it's dealing with, it deals with those issues, but it, it's clearly a break from many of the other earlier pieces uh, in the collection. Um, and I still collect her work. This is in the, in the, in the donated collection, but uh, pieces I've bought since the donation, she continues to evolve and do some really, really interesting things, including a tapestry she's done recently, um, working with, uh, which I've bought, uh, working with um, uh, Uyghur women in Xinjiang. Uh, and around the theme of religion and minorities uh, and women. So she's very active still. Um, the next one, I, I admit it's quite obvious, but it's uh, sex and power again. And this is a large uh, sculpture that uh, stands, I don't know, about so high off the floor. So when it was in my lounge room in my apartment, it was a bit hard to miss when you came in. Uh, but it, it, makes, it makes the point, uh, uh, her point fairly directly. Um, so sometimes you know, Eastern cultures aren't necessarily always that subtle. Um, this is uh, back to Guo Jen, uh, One World, One Dream, Ack a Dirty Mind. This is a large, um, a large, um, um, uh, what's the material? Um, 
Anyway, it, it's, it's a plasty type of tool. I just uh, slipped my mind. Um, resin. It's, it's a heavy, heavy resin. It's a big piece, weighs a lot. It's hollow inside, and it has um, uh, revolving neon lights uh, inside. The entire... It's a brain, and it's got the two halves of the brain. The entire brain, though, is one world because it's covered entirely with erotic carvings. Um, and it's on display in, um, in uh, uh, Bendigo. Uh, but it's, a, it's an amazing piece. And, of course, he did it in 2004, after Beijing, well after Beijing had been awarded the Olympics. But when the Beijing Olympic slogan came out, and the Olympic slogan was, one world, one dream. So uh, it's another, another naughty piece, which is you know, very attractive. So as I was filling out the collection, I also you know, wanted to move into other, other, other media, uh, including sculpture. So that was one gorgeous both sculpture installation. Uh, this is a sculpture by Guan Wei. It's a very big piece in bronze. It picks up bronze Wei. Guanwei's signature people and, and one of his themes, which, are, which is the cloud. Um, and uh, I actually had the chance, which I, I, I took, to buy Guanwei's very, very first sculpture. Uh, he started in 2008 doing sculpture after being a painter for, for a very long time. He's, he and his wife came into the, the residence in Beijing and she was holding this white bronze sculpture um, and said, Jeff, you must buy this. Said, Why? She said, well, one way is doing sculpture. And I asked how much. I said, oh, no, I, you know, I pleaded the usual things of penury as a government official and so on. Anyway, she's very persuasive. But I did have a, I did have a naughty thought that maybe uh, it would be good to have the very first edition of the very first sculpture that one way ever made. So uh, the trope has that as well. Um, very nice piece. This is a, a bust by Asir, which is much more um, uh, of his style of work. Uh, you saw his uh, painting at the beginning. Asir stopped painting many, many years ago and did these busts. And usually they're of uh, very soft-looking Chinese women uh, covered with blue and white porcelain or lacquerware, or croissant, uh, and they're just gorgeous, beautiful pieces. Uh, I was very lucky that... Um, um, uh, Asin gave this to me because they're terribly, terribly expensive. Um, well after I finished being ambassador, he just once said, we'll have this. And it was his first of this series of concrete busts. It's made of concrete. It's very heavy. Chrysanthemum leaves, wax and paint. Um, but this was from a series uh, that um, was shown. There's about 10 of these busts in the series. And they, um, together, collectively, won uh, a very important National Sculpture Prize in Australia. Um, and so, it's, it, 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 you know, no, I think no proper collection of Chinese contemporary art should be without a ASEAN bust, uh, especially if you don't have to pay for it. But he, he's also been a very good friend for a very long time. And finally, really, is this, uh, Xu Jungming's installation. This is a smaller version of what many, many large ones. And basically, it's a bit like the early cinema where the, 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 the wheel spins around and the light goes through it and you get movement. And he has all sorts of figures. This is babies, but he has all sorts of figures, lizards and animals and whatever, and they can climb and move and whatever. He um, is hugely big in Europe. He lives mostly in London. One of the big French fashion houses, I forget which now, some years ago, got him to do a fashion parade using his figures. Um, and I always knew it was way out of my price range. And although he was a good friend and I would love to have him in, in my collection, uh, I never even talked to him about ever about buying one. But he was really anxious for me to ha have a piece in the collection. And in the end, I just leveled with him. I said, it's just, I can't afford it. It's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And... Um, he eventually said to me, look, I so much want to be part of the collection. Um, I will um, uh, sell it to you for the cost of the materials. Now, that made it within reach. I have to say the materials weren't that cheap, though. Um, but I do have a Xu Jongming um, piece in the collection, and it spins around, and that's in the middle of the show in, in, in Bendigo. So 
that's a story of uh, chance, serendipity, um, uh, probably too much drinking and uh, lots of meals and things. But in the end of that, this is the accidental collection um, that La Trobe now has. And the last one is uh, uh, by Chen Wen Ling. You may know Chen Wen Ling. He's very famous for his Red Men series and um, uh, of sculptures. But he's also an excellent painter and drawer, which is not really fully appreciated. Um, he's also a very close friend, and this was his birthday present um, to me eight years ago. And it's the only piece I regret having donated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I should have actually remembered when I uh, invited Jeff, because I've done a lot of work on, on, with collectors, that you never ask a collector to talk about their collection, um, because they never stop. Uh, but what a fantastic um, uh, discussion, and to give us some insight into uh, Jeff's collection and why a lot of these works are in it. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, yeah, sure. and we have two roving microphones on either side. Um, so, if someone would like to start and ask a question of um, of Jeff, is there? Yes, there's a lady in. Here we are. The microphone is coming. Um, the rug you showed at the beginning. What's it made of? Sorry. The rug at the beginning. Uh, wool. Wool. And is it? For the wall, or is it meant to be wall? No, it would have been used. To, well, I, it's hard to say. It's propaganda, but but it could be either. But mm. it'd be more normal, I think, to have it on the floor. Okay. Thank you. Someone else? Yes, there's another lady in the middle. Kathy, is it? So what have you got at home now, Jeff? Uh, more than I can hang. Oh, right. <laughs> but, 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 but what happened, when, when I gave the collection to La Trobe, I opened myself to art from any source. Okay. So for many years, I only bought art from China, Chinese contemporary art. Um, but I, it's funny, I still do collect Chinese contemporary art. As I said, I'm still a collector of Rose Wong, and uh, she keeps doing interesting work and moving through her career. And it's nice to be in a position where I can you know, help, uh, not that I give her much financial support, but I can support a, uh, a young artist who uh, is so, uh, I think, creative. Um, but yeah, so I, I've just uh, broadened my, my field of vision since uh, making the donation. And do you have visiting rights? Uh, Sorry? Do you have visiting rights at Bendigo? Oh, yes, yes. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but one day, uh, for the true people here, we need to get the whole collection up. Yes. And uh, we could argue endlessly about what was selected and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would like to see the whole thing displayed in its entirety at some stage. And, and, and with a, a, a strong narrative theme, like I've tried to set out this evening, that the genesis of so much is contemporary Chinese art in the earlier propaganda period uh, and how it evolves as China society evolves. Right. Well, a lot of these artists have moved out of China. Uh, what about the ones that are left there? Are they in danger? At, at present, not in danger. Um, uh, and I should have said, I actually had in my notes, I meant to say that um, many of the works, particularly those, those latter half dozen or so, you would not be able to show in China in public spaces. So some of the artists might still be working on, on those sorts of themes and images, but uh, there's a very heavy ideological and propaganda overlay in Beijing these days. And people like Ling Jen, who did the Botticelli piece, um, you know, he is uh, a huge name, and his work is just so boring now. And I've said to him in the privacy of his studio, I said, "Look, Ling Jen, you know, what's going on?" He said, "Well, you know." So 
there is, I think, a lot of self-censorship going on now. Um, and many of these people, particularly the wealthier artists, and there's a lot, uh, would rather spend time outside of China than stay in China at present. Now, you know, as Colin knows better than most people, uh, these things will go through swings and changes, but we're currently in a very conservative mood. Uh, but um, I don't think artists are at risk to your question as such, but they know that the limits are there. I mean, even Guan Wei's had his show, a recent show in Beijing censored. And that's because his uh, you know, typical faces, just with a hole, uh, the censor said, well, we don't, know what, we don't know what this means, but clearly there's a message here, so <laughs> you're not hanging it. No. Yeah. Now, Colin's just asking about the ones in Australia. How creative are they? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think so, yeah. I mean, this, uh, this show we had uh, last week, we opened at the Vermilion, had uh, a lot of new work and things in it as well. So, yeah. Um, uh, and Guan Wei is just, just doesn't stop. I mean, he just you know, keeps producing and producing. So... I think, though, ultimately, for all of these Chinese artists, they would clearly prefer to be living and working in China than, oh. than overseas, because that's what they connect to, and that's where they get their ideas and stimulus from. So we might have to leave it there, but Jeff will be available. Yes. Yeah, sorry. No, no. But, but I, I just, uh, uh, just before we, we wrap up and finish, and thank you for being here, and thank you for the interest. Uh, I, I would like to recognise Dr. Damien Smith, uh, who curated the collection for uh, the, 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 the catalogue. And the catalogue's been instrumental in the gift and the donation to La Trobe uh, and in working on the, um, the uh, uh, exhibition in Bendigo. Um, and Damien and I are delighted because uh, Black Ink is about to publish it as a commercial uh, publication, which means all of you can buy your own copy, and I'll be very happy to sign it for you, or maybe Damien should sign it, not me. Um, but um, uh, uh, keep your eye out for that. And it's for me exciting to see how the collection continues to go and develop and, and, and has almost a life, uh, a life of its own. So, Damien, thank you very much. And w when Damien came on the scene, that's what really brought coherence to what I'd been doing. Um, uh, as I said at the start, I'm not an art expert in any way, shape or form. So um, thanks, Damien, and, and, and look out for the, the catalogue. It would be a great purchase. So, no, thanks, thanks, Jeff. I'd now like to ask um, Esther Thieler, past chair of uh, the Art History Alumni Group, to uh, give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll be very brief because I think we're all getting hungry and thirsty. But um, thank you so much for sharing with us this amazing story of your collection. Um, I think you've understated a little bit the role that you probably played. Um, I was there uh, on the Sunday after the opening of your um, exhibition in Bendigo and um, witnessed the conversation you had with two of your artists. And... Uh, it, I was struck by how, I think with both of those, they were probably very poor when you first knew them. Um, they were probably, uh, I know one of them at least was, was talking about the paucity of the uh, um, materials that he had to work with and you mentioned a little bit earlier the, um, the damage that's, that's occurred. Um, and I think that as students and appreciators of art history, as we all are, we really understand the... The, the vital importance that patrons and collectors play in the role of a young artist's life because, you know, they often are poor, they're doing important new work that is perhaps underappreciated and, um, you know, the uh, Caravaggio had Francesco Del Monte and uh, Peggy Guggenheim supported Max Ernst and, you know, Sunday and John Reed supported um, Sidney Nolan and Joy Hester and... Um, 
it's just so vital to have somebody like you who actually appreciates uh, the work, um, is willing to take a punt on the work, um, providing moral and emotional material support. So um, I think that's such an important story of the, the collection that you've um, pulled together over these years. And um, I think we all really appreciate your willingness to share that. And uh, the Trobe's incredibly lucky to receive, be the recipient and be uh, caretakers of that collection and be part of the next chapter of the story. And I, I know that collection will have a long, long narrative ahead of it as well. Um, so I'll just briefly also thank a few other people. Uh, Michael's thanked most people um, we needed to... to to mention, but I should just mention Anna Joski, who's um, just done an amazing amount of work uh, in helping us to organise this. And of course, on behalf of the committee, I must thank Michael Monyard, who um, has had a difficult time this year pulling the, the getting the engine rolling again after two years of um, Zoom uh, meetings. Um, I think Michael's already thanked the NGV and Restaurant Associates and uh, um, Bala, who put together the uh, exhibition in um, Bendigo. And I will also thank Professor Dodds for your wonderful introduction and um, for the kind words you said about, about the art history chapter. And th this reminds me, I thought that your PhD perhaps should have been for art history. <laughs> Except... I forgot, we don't have art history at La Trobe anymore, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, so thank you also to the audience for braving the inclement weather tonight and coming and joining us. Um, and I think I was going to say also, as Professor Dodd said, please go and visit Bendigo Art Gallery and see that wonderful exhibition. Um, there's also a complimentary exhibition from the Golden Dragon Museum. Um, and also, if you're there, cross the road and visit the La Trobe Art Institute, where at the moment there's a complimentary exhibition that's curated by Sophie Kai. Uh, it finishes this Sunday, but there's always something interesting to see there. Um, so I think that's, that's all. And Oh, sorry, go back. Yep, there we go. Refreshments in the foyer. Please join us. <laughs>